but he, will, he would always start, I need to ask you a question. I know this is going to sound racist, but, so he's excusing himself, and he knows it's going to be racist yeah. coming out, but now I can't say anything because he's already pointed out that it's racist. <laughs> so I'm like, left there, sitting there, I'm like, okay, that was racist, but I guess you know that. Now it's a perfect example of this double bind of, of microaggressions, which is that, um, you know, it's like you said, he already is setting this up to sort of make it your problem mm -hmm. instead of his. Now, my friend Monica says her mother taught her, anytime t someone tells you they're not something, yep. that's what they actually, right? So all that, <laughs> I'm not racist, but I'm not sexist, I'm not. Okay, so uh, here is a case example. Uh, uh, Derard Wing Su is a professor of education at Columbia, and he's written extensively and done a lot of research on microaggressions. In one of his articles, he describes an experience of going to a conference with an, so he's Asian, with an African-American colleague. Um, it was one of those little puddle jumper planes. They got into the plane. They were about the first two to get in the plane. And they took a seat towards, have you read this? Towards the front of the plane. The other people began to get on the plane. And then the flight attendant um, came over the loudspeaker and said, we need to redistribute the, you know, for the weight of the plane. We need to redistribute the weight for the balance of the plane and asked Dr. Sue and his colleague to move to the back of the airplane. Now, they were the first people that got on. They were sitting uh, in the front. The other passengers that came on were white. Um, Dr. Sue, being a scholar of microaggressions, um, had that moment where you go, you make that calculus, do I say something? Do I, and said to the flight attendant, um, you know, I'm offended that you would ask me and my colleague to go into the back of the airplane um, when we were the ones that came on first. And of course, the flight attendant um, escalated and said, oh my gosh, how dare you call me a racist? Like, this wasn't racist at all. It's about the, right, it's about the weight of the plane and the safety of the passengers. So what Sue points out in the article is he says, these microaggressive acts can usually be explained away. I'm not racist, but I gotta ask you something. They can be explained away for seemingly, or at least superficially, non-biased and valid reasons. This had nothing to do with race. I'm trying to redistribute the weight on the plane so that the airplane remains safe, right? But for the recipient of the microaggression, there's always this nagging feeling of, did that really happen? Did I make a mountain out of a molehill? So now it works to kind of mess with your head. So you start questioning your own experience of reality. Maybe I'm blowing this up out of... All right, so Sue talks about four dilemmas uh, related to microaggressions. The first one is, uh, he calls the clash of racial realities. And this is differences between white Americans and Americans of color. So white Americans tend to believe, in general, minorities are doing much better in life. Discrimination was a thing, but it's not that big a thing anymore. It's really not significant. We've come a really long way for equality. Whereas minorities perceive whites as racially insensitive, unwilling to share or give up the power and the wealth, believing they're superior, need to control everything, um, and treating uh, folks who are not white poorly because of their race. I've had, since I teach in Pensacola, I uh, interact with a lot of military or ex-military um, students, and when I teach this class in diversity, it's happened many times where someone will say, I'm a veteran in the military, and racism does not exist in the military. Because we're all in there together. And I usually say, when someone other than a white person tells me that, I will begin to believe it. So here we have the perception that only a white guy in the military can afford to say, 
it's a great melting pot and we all have, but if you ask someone who wasn't white, I see some of my ex-military friends in here, they'll tell you that's not the case. So that's one of the dilemmas. <coughs> There's also soft bigotry. Being in education, I've seen it too many times. Professors will say, well, I'm going to pass this young black male because you all have had a difficult time. And you know, he can't really speak any better, he can't write any better because he's black, so I'm just going to pass him. Rather than passing the student on based on some curricular objectives, I'm right. passing him because he's black. So that's soft bigotry, that's just as bad as that last oh, wow. bullet you there. That's, wow. That's, wow, that's a great term. <coughs> um, dilemma number two, the invisibility of these unintentional expressions of bias. So how do you prove that a microaggression actually occurred when, as I said, if you decide to what is it, like confront someone or put it back on your coworker, um, you're go it's going to be discounted. Like, I don't see color. What am I, I always say, if you don't see color, please get out of social work. Because believe me, <laughs> your clients that are not white see color really uh, clearly. <laughs> Um, I'm a good person, right? So um, how do you prove that a microaggression has occurred when um, the person that you, for lack of a better word, confront um, has a million reasons why to discount it from who my friends are, how advanced I am? Um, <laughs> dilemma number three, the perceived minimal harm of racial microaggressions. This is, I love this cartoonist from the New Yorker. She shot him and he's saying no biggie. So, <laughs> you bring up these experiences, and sometimes even members of your own disenfranchised group will say, don't make a big deal, you know, like just, as they say in Frozen, let it go, right? So just let it go. Why are you making a big deal out of this? You're making something worse by pointing it out. Whoops, Miss Patton. <laughs> And the, the fourth dilemma, uh, which is the catch-22 of responding to them. So here's that dilemma again. That, uh, first of all, you start to question your own reality. Like, did they just say that? I felt like a, a dart, an arrow, like a little tinge there. Um, how should I respond? Do I just let it go? It's, will it blow up to something bigger? Um, what if there's negative consequences? Oftentimes, we already have said it in here, you bring it up, now you are actually fueling and feeding the stereotype of an angry black woman. See, we knew all along that that was what they were. What a perfect example here. It won't do any good. This is, speaks to that sort of, uh, you know, erosion of self-esteem and almost the learned Helplessness. It's so hard to fight this stuff when it happens over and over again. And then even, you know, we mess with our own heads. I probably am making a big deal out of this. Maybe this didn't actually happen. If I respond with anger um, or strike back, I'll be accused of being either oversensitive or paranoid, um, or I'll be told that my emotional outburst actually confirms uh, stereotypes about my race. So this is the real catch-22. I want to, since I always have to talk about uh, gay things, I want to tell you one of my favorite gay microaggressions. And I want to ask you why it's a microaggression. So I have gotten this over time from some women. You're gay? What a waste. <laughs> What's the microaggression? <laughs> like I'm a waste, I, it's a waste of my DNA or because I'm like, yeah. Now when I say, wow, I'm a waste, that's kind of insulting. They say, oh no, 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 we're just trying to tell you that you're hot. 
<laughs> and then I say, well, why don't you just tell me I'm hot instead of telling me that I'm a waste? I was just saying, it's like saying that since your orientation is not to them, that it's just a waste of time, but like you have your own life. Right. Yeah. Okay. Here's the humbling news we touched on a little bit earlier. Um, most people in society, especially look at the, I'm always like, you know, the, I do these talks and I'm always talking to the church choir, right? Like the, where are the people that should be hearing this? So, you know, most of us experience ourselves as fair and decent people who would not intentionally discriminate. But as someone else uh, pointed out, you know, we're products of society. You're going <coughs> to take this stuff in just by osmosis from watching television and being raised in the United States and looking at textbooks and looking at magazines, you know, in Publix uh, while, you're, while you're waiting to check out. So everybody commits microaggressions. It's a little bit like what Charmaine said. If you're accused of committing one, um, just take a breath, um, apologize, and then talk about it and explore it with whoever has said this, right? Engage in a dialogue. That's how change is going to happen. Here are some recommendations for uh, change. So, you know, how do we uh, stop this stuff? Listen, we are all, uh, we are not all a single identity. Some of you have sort of pointed out tonight what happens when you are reduced to a single facet of your identity, right? Like, what are you? Well, I'm a whole lot of things. So, we all have multiple identities. Some of our identities are privileged identities, and some of them are marginalized, right? So, um, you may be Caucasian, and you have been conferred with white privilege, but you are female. Female, uh, being female, that is a subordinated gender in our society, right? So one thing I say to people is to think a little bit about your many facets um, and think about that part of your identity that is not privileged and experiences or injuries or hurts that you've experienced as a result of that. And if you can tap into that part of you, I think it gives you more uh, compassion for the experiences of others from marginalized groups. Um, what about those, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What about those who are not in any of those <laughs> social identity, uh, marginalized identities? Boy, so that's a lot you know, I'm talking one real subset. <laughs> White male, yes, white straight, non-disabled, non-disabled, heterosexual. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They fall in all of those yes. privileged categories. They've never experienced it. Don't forget ages. Whoop, go ahead. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Go ahead. Even though the, you are privy to all those things as white, you should still, if, if you're old enough, you, they at least should have the ages in the drawing because. Older Americans are discriminated Here's the other thing. multiple things. So these people have daughters uh, some of the time. They have sisters. They have mothers. Like everybody has, you know what I mean? So um, I hear you loud and clear. In fact, I always, when I get assigned the diversity class, I, I always go, oh my god, thank god that I'm gay because every other aspect of me is privileged. I have every other, I'm an overeducated, white guy that was, you know, that went to private colleges with well-off parents. So, I am not... <laughs> Thank you for keeping it real. It's the struggle is real, right? No, so, I, I mean, I joke about that, but I think, because here's the other thing that I have found with diversity training, which I want to tell you. So, um, if I were giving this speech, if I were an African-American man, my account would be discounted, right? Because I have skin in the game, right? So it's, it's a sad reality that 
the accounts of members of marginalized groups get discounted. Of course, it's a, it's a racist society. According to him, like he's black, it is sad that my African American colleague, uh, Dr. King, Dion King, uh, who many of you know, at UWF can say the same thing that I say, except that it's coming out of an African American female mouth instead of a, a white guy, a white male mouth. And her account is sort of delegitimized because she is supposedly biased. You know, um, her is an angry black woman. Yes, she is. She is all that. <laughs> so, um, how might my privileged identity impact others who aren't privileged? What does it mean in work situations, in your everyday situations when you interact with members of different groups? And then finally, how can I use my privilege to positive, you know, people go like, what am I supposed to do? I didn't enslave anybody. <laughs> my family was like, okay, so you're off, you seriously think you're off the hook for that? <laughs> if you have your privilege, use your privilege in a way that's going to help the cause and move everybody away from the margins into the center. Use the, I guess, Geez, I'll tell you something else. Does anyone know about the Harvard Implicit Bias Test? Have you heard of this? Google this. This is this test that you can do on your computer that tests. Oops, sorry. Am I done? No, just hold on a second. Um, they're about to tow cars, or they are towing cars? Have you read here? If you read here about his real name, it's a token card. It shows two lots right to the right of the building. Oh my gosh, we've lost half the audience. Let me just say, it's a half of five. It's very true. So if you have a computer, if you have a computer, go home and Google the Harvard Implicit Bias Test. This is a test that.